Hi, my name is Soraya Chenya Stefke, and I'm a senior majoring in neuroscience. And today I'm going to be talking about Momordica carantia from the Cucurbitaceae family. And to begin my presentation, I just wanted to start with a quote by Hippocrates about the relationship between diet and health. And he said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And we've mentioned in this class before, and you've just recently mentioned functional foods and med medicinal, medicinal foods. And so this plant is definitely an ex exemplary example of, of functional food. But first off, what does it look like? Um, because it's part of the cucurbitaceae family, it's related to um, pumpkins, squashes, cucumbers, and you can see it's kind of a funky cousin of the cucumber. It's oblong green, and it has it, the distinct warts and ridges and a very uneven surface. And you can also see in the two above pictures how it changes dramatically from an unripe, where it's like green, um, I guess clothes essentially, and then when it's super ripe, it turns into a brilliant yellow and it bursts actually to reveal the seeds and drop the seeds to regrow. And as it's part of the Momordica genera, which means to bite in Latin, that's referencing the jagged leaves um, of the plant. And it grows best in a hot, humid climate, so it's grown a lot in Asia, China, India region, Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. And in the bottom two pictures, you can see two common um, varieties, which is the Chinese, the smoother, lighter green, and the Indian variety, which is very distinctive. It's um, dark green and warty. But the more scientific categorization of Momorica carantia is um, by diameter, about the size of the diameter. And all parts of this plant are bitter, hence the common name bitter melon, bitter gourd. It's also referred to as balsam pear, balsam apple. And of course, depending on what region or culture you go to, it can be called Corella in Hindi and Ampalaya in the Philippines. And it's believed to originate and be domesticated in Asia. You can follow the arrows there, somewhere between the Indian and Chinese region. And it was first mentioned there in China and India in Ayurvedic texts almost 4,000 years ago and in ancient Chinese medical texts. And from Asia, it moved into Africa. And then from Africa, it moved into Brazil. The arrow kind of shows that um, during the slave trade. And through this movement, the most prevalent use was, of course, in the kitchen. And it can, prepare, it can be prepared in a variety of ways. As you can see, stir fries, stews, stuffed. And when cooking it, it is usual to actually boil the and then throw out that water just to attenuate that very, very strong bitter flavor. And traditional uses. This is going to be a lot, so I'm going to glean um, a lot of the uses. And if you have any questions, you can ask me later. So how do, we, how do you typically use it in traditional medicine? You can extract the juice from the fruit and leaves, or you can boil it and make a tea or a bath, depending on what you're using it for. And so, historically speaking, diabetes is the most famous and common um, ailment that bitter melon treats. In traditional Chinese med medicine, which is based <coughs> on the principle of an equilibrium between yin and yang, diabetes is believed to be a yin defici deficiency. It's also used in topically as skin ailments for itches, scabies, ringworm. And it's also used in female reproductive health, whether as a contraceptive or to um, alleviate menstrual pain. In China, it can also be used as a tea for gastrointestinal problems, whether that's parasites, um, stimulating hunger even. And in India, it can be used on the farm for cattle. If, a, if your cow has a fever, you can make a paste, I believe, with the root of this plant and then apply it onto the head and the horns and it'll feel better. And it can also be used for a snake bite antidote. So it encompasses a, a lot of <laughs> different treatments. In Africa, in the other parts of the world, um, as mentioned before, it's, it can be used topically for skin inflammations, one of which is measles in Nigeria. In Togo, what is really fascinating about this is it also has a spiritual component. This is believed to um, be part of the history because one of the main tribes in Togo had to flee due to warfare and they wore this as like um, jewelry 
um, bracelets, and so it's believed to have a protective and spiritual factor as well. And throughout Africa in general, and as mentioned in China, it alleviates a lot of gastrointestinal problems. And what's super cool that I found interesting was in the Caribbean, how it's used in ethno-veterinary purposes. As you can see in the two pictures, they actually give their dog baths in bitter melon water, and supposedly it'll help them hunt better for this particular rodent, just because they kind of look similar. Maybe that's what they believe, and apparently it works, so that's good for them. And throughout South America and the Caribbean in general, it's used for fertility and childbirth, as mentioned um, in China as well. So it encompasses a wide variety of treatments, ailments, any part of the plant really, and so it's very useful. And I'm assuming it's so useful because there are over 200 known compounds in this, so it can attack anything. And if you look in the second column, you can recognize a lot of the compounds that we've mentioned in class, like glycosides, opponents, triterpenes, alkaloids. But the three star um, chemical compounds are carantin, memortisin, and up there you can see polypeptide P, insulin. And so, as I mentioned before, diabetes is the most famous disease that it's used to, because it has um, shown hypoglycemic activity, but we still aren't really sure how it lowers blood sugar levels. And there's been hypotheses suggesting that it has a structure similar to animal insulin. It can also increase um, beta cell production in the pancreas. It can <coughs> make, and these are, and for each um, hypothesis, there has been like a paper or a study, but we aren't sure like definitively which one it is yet, or it might be a combination of all of them. It can also increase glucose breakdown, which is an extra pancreatic mechanism. And another suggestion, this is from a recent paper in 2011, that this dehydrogenase type 1 is highly implicated in diabetes and obesity, which of course are comorbid. And this bitter melon has an inhibitor, that, and that might also help with the um, hypoglycemic um, effects of this plant. And it also reduces lipid and cholesterol levels as well. It also has antioxidant properties, and it's been shown to retard, not necessarily um, reduce the incidence, but definitely retard and suppress tumor growth. And it does this by in, um, inducing apoptosis or calling NK cells, natural killer cells, and inhibits um, the G2 and M phases of cell synthesis in tumor cells. And this has, and it's shown antioxidant properties for leukemia, lymphoma, melanoma, breast cancer, and a couple other cancers. So it's pretty all-encompassing. Um, another property it has is antibacterial and antiviral. It's been shown um, to inhibit bacterial growth in E. coli, salmonella, and the bacteria that causes TB, which is highly useful because TB is also prevalent in a lot of the countries and regions that it's grown in. Another protein in bitter melon is MAP30, and this has also shown antiviral properties. Specifically regarding <coughs> HIV, it can inhibit HIV-1 integrase, which can be highly useful. And just in general, it's used for a lot of things. It's used for against parasites, against the bacteria that produces ulcers. It can do against polio, against herpes. Um, and like we've mentioned plants before, it can be used um, as a contraceptive. So it's used a lot. And there have been a couple studies done, clinical studies done. One example is in um, 1981 where they, where it was a control, the bitter melon juice and natural consumption is just fried vegetable. Unfortunately, um, in a review study of many of the previous studies that have, clinical studies that have been conducted, there were a lot of shortcomings, there wasn't a large control group, there wasn't just a lot, there wasn't a large um, population sample, there wasn't standardization. In 2011, there was a more legitimate study, as in it was multi-week, over like 200 people participated but they analyze, they, their variable was fructosamine, which is a good indicator of the glycemic level, not necessarily glucose. So there has been research done, but not something extremely cohesive yet. And contraindications, anyone, of course, allergic to the family should avoid this, and it's apparently one of 
a very popular um, allergy. Um, for people trying to get pregnant, whether it's a man, and it reduces sperm in men, and it can, of course, affect pregnancy in women. It can induce favism, which is a type of anemia. Don't eat the seeds because there's been case studies of children, you know, ac or old, older people accidentally ingesting it, and it can induce toxici toxicity. And for people who are diabetic, just be careful with medication because you can just, your blood sugar level can plummet. And speaking of um, hypoglycemia, over 30, about 34% of adults use a form of CAM therapy in diabetes, so it's very useful. And this is how it's marketed today as an herbal supplement in the herb herbal memory market. And it can come as capsules, um, liquids, dry powder, but it's most known as a functional food, just an incorporation into one's diet. And it's historically and currently relevant, as you can see someone actually made a costume for bitter melon. And it's had uh, an incredibly long history in almost every continent. And as we've seen, it's used for almost everything. The only setback is the lack of conclusive clinical trials, but if this can be done in a more cohesive fashion, I'm sure it can be better incorporated into medicine. And it is a wonderful functional food, even though it's kind of bitter, but it's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you.